it will likely not change the world, in my opinion, like a big bang, like woo, and tomorrow we have everything. But uh, it will be, in the, I think, in a way, like the web uh, changed the world uh, from the last 10 years, 15 years on. It's just making the web better. Um, it's adding a little bit of data in there that computers can make use of to help us in our tasks, whether it be searching for stuff on the web, whether it be trying to gather stuff together on a certain topic, um, whatever. It's, it's enabling um, us to do things easier and maybe even new things that we can't do at the moment. Google and Yahoo index the data, the RDF data that is on the web. And what we are doing here, among others, is to create this data, uh, but not only create the data, also create the models, the languages, and the protocols that are used to create this data. So the focus is, is on human beings, not on machines. While we generate data for machines, in the end of the day, the purpose is to support us as human beings. Well, the immediate benefit is that it improves how people can cope with the vast amount of knowledge on the web, which nobody can actually do in a reasonable manner uh, anymore. Because a lot of people that we work with are not technology minded. They're not focused on semantic web. We have to explain that, what that is to them. We have to explain what ontologies are and what all this business is. And in a lot of cases, you get a thousand yard stare. So people don't understand. So what we have to do is show them. Here's an example. So the semantic web for me is about giving structure to the data which is on the web uh, and making its meaning more obvious. Um, that means you want to make connections on that data which is on the web which, they, which are not there explicitly but which are obvious for humans, for example, who search the net. Semantic web provides um, means to get at information and um, means to filter information, it provides means to find people, um, it provides means to enable people put things together in an easier fashion. Right now that's all those things are very manual processes and uh, there is a potential for semantic uh, web to be used in those environments to make those processes more automatic and easier for the average user to use and to deploy. Um, you know, there's a standard definition for the semantic web, which is that it's an extension to the current web that enables computers um, um, to process the information that's on the web in a way that's useful to, for people. Um, and there's a whole load of different, you know, terms for the web. You've got web 2.0, semantic web, synaptic web, mobile web, real-time web, you know. But I think what's important is you can think of them all coming together to make the web a better, a better web, the web that we're using to improve it in some way. So like web 2.0, improve the web by um, adding collaboration functionality, allowing people to share, um, to um, comment on content, and to, I suppose, make more of a read write web where they could um, exchange content with each other. And um, the semantic web is um, extending the web by allowing us to add information to, it, to the web that is understandable by machines. So what this means is, if you think of a web page that, um, for example, is describing a person, I can look at a web page that describes me, John Bresnan. I can look at a web page that describes you, Tom Murphy. And I know immediately it's about a person. For a computer, it's a bit more difficult. They mightn't understand straight away that the information described in the web page is about a, a person or um, an event or a company or whatever. So, in my understanding, it's all about uh, making machines speaking with machines better and humans speaking with machines better. So, uh, typically, you have tasks that might be uh, somewhere in the enterprise or in the governmental area where you have to deal with a lot of data, right? Yeah. Uh, now that can be kind of boring, or it can be very uh, hard to get all that raw data sorted, you filter for it or whatever you, what you're looking for, you have to, you're in a process to uh, compile a report or whatever. And what you actually want is that the machine can support you in a way that it actually focuses on what it can best, and that is working with the data and helping you to do what, what you need to do. So humans are good at certain things, and machines are good at certain things. Tim Berners-Lee, when he first introduced the web to people, had difficulties actually explaining to it. So consider yourself to be a person in 19, 1989, and Tim Berners-Lee sitting opposite to you and explaining to, to you what a global 
text uh, hypertext uh, system could look like, what it would do in terms of offering services to the web. I think everybody, including me, would, would have said you are completely nuts. This mm -hmm. will, will neither, neither work, nor can it uh, emerge, nor um, would it do any, anything useful. Um, and I think what it's very important to, to keep in, in, into mind is that um, these, are very, these ideas are very, very difficult to communicate at the very beginning when the infrastructure isn't there yet, but very easy to, to understand and very easy to see the benefit once they have been in place. And then everybody's asking myself, why didn't I see it at, at that particular time? And I have this, the same feeling when each and every time we try to explain what this will do, because the underlying concepts are typically very easy. What we try to do is, is bringing the, world, the world's knowledge together um, making it interlinked, making it, it far more usable. Uh, but explaining how it will look like and what it will do is in fact very difficult if you didn't have first-hand experience uh, in, in just trying um, out what, what, what is happening. So I think what is very important for all of us is to come up with credible demos that really shows the benefit. The idea of the semantic web is to make the, make the web more, uh, let's say, smarter in the sense that the current web that we have is a web of documents. So you can read documents and you can link one document to another, but a computer cannot understand what's on the pages. Um, and the idea of the semantic web is to make these things smarter by describing not only documents, but the things that are described in these documents and to make some stronger links between these things. For instance, you've got a page talking about dairy and from that page, uh, using the semantic web, you will, or at least the computer will understand that this is about a research institute that is part of the University of Galway and that is working on semantic web technologies. So why do we need it or, or uh, what's, what's useful about this? Um, it's, it's, it's going to enable many different applications. Search is the one most people think about because people obviously have problems trying to search for um, content at the moment as well. So you know, we're used to seeing big long lists of search results and trying to figure out which one is the, the, the one we're actually interested in is often a matter of you know clicking on a couple of ones and then figuring out that's the right one. If you can actually augment search results with a little bit of extra semantic metadata from that's gathered from a page that has semantic information behind it, you can actually make it easier to then decide what you're going to click on. The web has grown tremendously over the last couple of years. It's now a fundamental part of society, but we're all experiencing also the limits of uh, what the web can do for us. And we want to push these this limits um, and want to go beyond what is currently possible. Link uh, all the information and all the knowledge that can exist on the web uh, so that you can more easily find what you need and also um, more easily uh, browse information from one uh, part to another. So it's yeah, basically a more convenient access to information. You, but you could, with the data which is available, you could get these connections much more immediate. You could um, be able to answer much more structured queries. You, so you could an answer questions which are connected. So for example, you could answer questions for um, what are my friends currently listening and are there any concerts of, of these uh, bands performing around my area? To a database, we can ask complex structured queries. We cannot do this on the web. We can only ask very simple queries to, to the web. We can um, only find um, information by kind of poking into big files and information and getting maybe some smaller piles back, but then we still have to find ourselves our way through these smaller piles. So even if, it's only, even if it would only be uh, about being able to get search results back and being able to answer complex queries on this big pile of search results which I get back, um, I would have uh, an improved experience already about web search. Well, oftentimes when you're searching for something on the web, you know what you're looking for in advance. And uh, it's very hard to tell a search engine that, yeah, just show me the stuff that's, that's about people or just show me the stuff that's about events in, in a certain place. So if you type in Galway, you're going to get um, you know, information about the city, probably some stuff about James Galway, the flutist, whatever. But you probably know when you're actually going to search engine that you're actually looking for things that are happening in Galway right now. So you want to actually be able to filter out by events in a certain time frame. Ones are coming up in maybe the next two weeks or in the next few days if you're only happening to be in Galway for a short amount of time. So it's, it's important to be able to um, 
know what it is that you're looking at when you're getting some search results back at you. So that you could say, yeah, I actually want to click on this one because I know it's about an event that's coming up rather than I know it's a, some kind of history of a family that live in Galway or something else that's unrelated to what you're actually trying to do at the moment. So I don't know what's, whether that's for you, but uh, the same. But um, maintaining knowledge in my inbox, maintaining my contacts in, in 10 social networks, um, trying to find the right information which I'm looking for uh, is is not solved to a satisfactory extent with current technologies. Um, actually, it needs a lot of knowledge. So even researchers and scientists like myself, we have problems of um, finding the right information or, or getting access to the right information. And it's a very long um, workflow of getting, for example, to some article which you're searching for, extracting the relevant knowledge from this article to pursue your own research. Um, and anything which makes, which speeds up this process um, is, is actually money. So it's, um, it's something which, which will, so any, any, basically any research which improves um, the efficiency of knowledge work um, is monetizable. So I think on the long run this is uh, very important. Um, well, the system is croaking and creaking, creaking on all different aspects. The cost for processing information has um, exploded. There's so much available at the same time we are not able to select and process it in a way uh, that we really should need, need to be able to do that. Uh, email boxes of the average person are right now overflowing. Um, at least, um, if uh, it has, if they have um, a lot of different contexts and different projects that people need to work on, what we need to do is to give those people tools that enable them to deal with all this kind of different information, with all the different contexts, with everything that they now are getting uh, channeled uh, to from the digital channels that surround them. Well, I think the. You can think that the semantic web might be more needed now because we get more and more data, uh, especially with uh, all this user-generated content that comes from blogs, microblogs, wikis, where everyone can contribute. If you take the web in the 90s, uh, most of the websites were um, kind of built in crossword. You got only your team working on a the, on the website to maintain the website. And now we got, uh, with all these services, anyone can contribute. So we got more and more content. And we need smarter ways to make sense of this content and to understand it and to make uh, more efficient use of that content. The first thing is to make the data more understandable for machines. So that is to uh, introduce the semantics, making the semantics explicit. Um, what I mean by that is quite simply, if you look at current uh, HTML documents, which were, of course, for humans to, to read and to interpret, uh, humans don't have a problem with that, to actually interpret what a sentence or a heading is about. But machines do. So a, a program, if you want to write a program that tries to figure out what the page is about, it's pretty hard for that program because it doesn't know about the context, it doesn't know what actually is in a paragraph. But if you sort of annotate it, if you help the machine to understand what a certain word, a certain image or whatever means, then the program uh, can do something with it. It can help you filter the data, it can help you integrate data from different sources. And that's the main thing, what at least I'm after. So making this data more understandable for machines. At the same time, because information is machine readable, we can let machines do all the filtering that that we need uh, that we need to, to have done for for us in order to process to process something that that we couldn't do before. So while more information is becoming available in a, in a structured form, because it is structured, now machines can do tasks for us, it, which is exactly what where we need to get to. The problem is that most of the data out there is not really uh, explicitly available in the form that we can directly process it. So it might be in a PDF. If you look in a PDF, a nice PDF document, again, a human could perfectly read that. But I can't directly easily write a program that actually processes me that for some report or for some from querying or whatever. So it is available as PDF, as Excel sheet or whatever, but it's not in available in a, in a kind of uniform format. And that is what RDF, and that's one of the pillars of the semantic web, actually comes in. It gives us a, a way, a uniform way to express this data. Now there's been a lot of efforts to publishing semantic web data embedded within normal web pages. 
So you'll have a web page, but behind the scenes, there's a little bit of markup there. You've got different ways to add semantic web content on the web. You can either create new documents using uh, full uh, RDF to say, well, this is a new document that describes a person, and that person is working on that project or listening to that music. But if you already got an HTML page describing that person, uh, you can use this RDFA markup. So you still have your original HTML contents. You still have the pages that we got today. But in addition, you add these simple snippets of code that says, well, this page uh, is about that person or is about that project or that song. At the end, the software that you will use uh, will be for end user. And the end user will not see any RDFA markup or anything. It will just use a normal application that, well, for instance, right now you are using an email client, but you don't know anything about the email protocols. You don't know anything about the headers that are sent through your mail client uh, from your uh, laptop to, uh, to anyone. So that will be the same using Semantic Web Application. You will not have to learn uh, that there is RDFA, that the data is uh, then uh, queried using Sparkle, and that we get linked data principles. You will just use an application. That will be built on this technology, but you won't care about the technology. You will just use something that works better than before. Uh. It's not so hard if it's, if it's happening at the very early stage in the process. So for example, BBC is one of the examples where they directly expose uh, data in RDF. Then it's pretty easy because they have their relational database or whatever in the background. And if they directly expose it as RDF, then it's pretty easy for consumers to do something with it. If they put it, decide to put it as PDF or hidden in, in some other format, then someone else has to do that kind of making that data yeah. explicit, right? So it really depends on where in the process uh, this happens. It's, it's always possible to do it, of course, but the later it happens, the, the more effort is needed. So first of all, you have to get knowledge providers um, to making the structure of their knowledge, which they, um, which they publish on the web. Um, to, you have to get them to provide this knowledge in a structured form. So at least give me some hooks that you're talking about events, that you're talking about a band, that you're talking about a person, and not just writing plain text with, um, with just words. Um, even there, I mean, with natural language processing, which is also a part of the semantic web, um, you, could, um, you could get out of some of the structure of, of just plain text. Um, and what is much more helpful would be if the data providers themselves um, could expose some of their internal knowledge. And um, what makes this much more um, important also is that uh, most of the data which is on the web actually comes from structured knowledge bases, so comes from databases. You know, Semantic Web is suffering from this chicken and egg problem where you don't get the cool applications until you get the data out there. And you know, no one's going to put the data out there unless they can see the cool applications. So one or the other has to happen. But if you, if you take a kind of an incremental step and actually get the semantic data out there, um, then at least you have got the, the way of, of, um, of powering these cool applications. And um, the fact is people are creating a lot of you know, rich, semantically rich data through their everyday activities on the web. They're, even just commenting on something, add some kind of weight to something that didn't have a comment on it before, you're saying this is more important than maybe it was previously, or you're adding a topic to something, or you're um, maybe linking to something else, you're kind of enriching something um, just through your kind of activities, through creating content. And then if you actually can expose these features or, fun or properties of, of what you've written in some semantic format, it becomes usable by somebody else to do something else with that. At the beginning, uh, people in the semantic web tried to build the semantic web from the top, right? Like you try to build a house and start with the roof. That might work out in certain circumstances, but usually you start with the foundation, right? And that is where, where we actually, in the last couple of years, started to build the foundation. The foundation is the data. You build the data, and on top of the data, you can do other things. You can do reasoning, you can do a lot of uh, trust and whatnot else, but the house really needs to be built from the, from the base, from the foundation on. And that is the most, at least for me, the most important insight and, and motivation for linked data. The, the, the less they have to try, the less, I suppose, it's like this threshold that people have to cross. The lower that threshold in terms of understanding is, the better it is for them, and the easier they'll accept the technology, whatever it is you're, you're showing to them. So I tend to focus on the functionality, and I would say, this is what it does. And by the way, it does it because I've done all this other, other cool stuff in the background, but you don't necessarily need to know that. So I tend to not demonstrate 
the technology, but I tend to demonstrate ideas and tend to demonstrate this is how you would do it in the future if you use this technology. The, cat, the catchphrase would, in the end of the day, unlocking your own, your own information and the value of your own in, in, information. Seeing what you have done, what you are producing, what you know in relation what else exists there, rather than uh, just sitting on your own isolated island. There must be, uh, that's what kind of is agreed, there must be some kind of incentive for people doing that, right? Uh, one incentive uh, that was introduced last year by Google um, using RDFA or microformats is uh, that you, if you do that, if you mark up your, your uh, page with, with RDFA or microformats, that your, uh, the, the, the search result actually looks better. Uh, you're better ranked, you're more prominently um, displayed within Google. And that's a, a quite a huge uh, incentive actually for, for people. And we have seen it already with uh, the good relation ontology which is uh, for expressing how much you know, uh, a product costs or where it is offered and so on. And people actually use it. A lot of people, uh, a lot of organizations and, and uh, companies start using a good relation ontology with RDFA to uh, make them look better in Google. So that's a valid incentive. So it's actually becoming quite tied to the area of search engine optimization where people, you know, it's almost a dirty word in the past, but people have been trying to figure out what keywords to use to actually boost their their um, results in, in search engine rankings. But you can imagine if you have some kind of semantic metadata in there that's been created by people and is being exposed then through semantic web technologies to search engines or other applications to use, this is something that's going to be um, quite interesting for people who are developing websites and deciding how they can actually make them more attractive to people who are you know, looking for stuff. So you know, I, I think it's only really happening in, in the past you know, year or so that this is beginning to take off. Well, one valuable thing for companies sharing their data is that people can build applications uh, using this data. So, for instance, if I build an application using data from the New York Times or from the BBC, uh, then people will know that these data come from the BBC and the New York Times and then can visit back the website. So that's uh, also a way to make your content more discoverable and by extent to make people uh, visit your website by coming back to the website. And if we take, for instance, government data, the incentives are different. Uh, and here it's mainly to get more transparency and to let citizens know what's happening about the, uh, the data from their government. So whenever, I, I would argue, whenever someone uh, has data and wants, wants or has to, uh, you might know the, the um, there's a directive from the EC that all the governmental uh, bodies in the, in the European Union have to publish their data. Uh, so if they put some Excel sheet there, that would be fair enough, right? That, that's all they need to do, actually. Um, however, if they do it in RDF, um, and a lot of other organizations do it also in RDF, then it would be pretty easy to uh, merge these uh, results together. So you could um, see from different, or you could compare from different countries in, throughout Europe. So if you're talking about um government um, or public organizations, um, what's the use of them for the semantic web is basically transparency and um, making their data available to the public is just about that transparency. So it's, it's more about getting data out than um, providing really the applications of that data themselves. People can, as, so, as soon as the data out, um, people can come along and develop their own applications on that data. I think the main thing, the main observation is that people on the web already are doing that kind of mashup. However, you know, if you have, for example, Google Maps and you have a mashup with what uh, kind of, I don't know, petrol stations are around there, you actually already have a kind of mashup already in place. However, these mashups are kind of limited because they are developed against uh, a fixed set of APIs. So from, from a developer point of view, you always have to know what kind of data you can expect and then you can do a one-to-one -one mashup. If you uh, want to enable that on a large scale, then you can do it, you best do it with RDF, with linked data, and then you can uh, do that kind of mashup with any kind of data sources, not only with the one which are uh, exposed and, and defined by big players like Google or others. And that's kind of, if you wish, a democratic uh, way of, of exposing your data and using your data. So a typical flow of, of um, 
information that I can saw happening over in the last couple of years is not necessarily in fact coming from 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 corporations but in fact going from corporations going from the what is happening on the web on the internet to be used in corporation I mean corporate or used in, in, in then in corporate environments so you talk about wikis blogs mm. uh, for example forums online social networks all those develop first on the web sometimes incorporate small startups but sometimes also just as collective community effort and then they they grew big and then they entered corporations so um, and I think that's that's a very very valid way of uh, technology transfer or actually co inf inflation of, of corporations been happening so what I would would say to, to the corporate IT guy is prepare your argument based on technology that already is being used and why it's been used and that's been adopted and that there's a critical mass of, of people and users, a potential market already there or right now forming and that gives you an argument that you can present to your corporate board or, it, or your manager. A quicker route and sometimes to getting an impact with your technology is to work with somebody they have already worked with. So you work with the companies they've worked with and they you partner with them to find a way to add value to those existing products that you don't have to reinvent a complete product set that you can actually say here's a technology. We have looked at it from the fundamental side, we, we've looked at it from the applied side, and we want to see if we can commercialize it with you. And that's really where that, that, that final loop happens. The web is a resource for all of humanity, not just for one single company. And it's a global agreement that has been achieved uh, among all the users that exist on the web. The global agreement is how to represent documents and how to send documents around. And that's something very difficult to achieve. You, you can share your data on the web on any format. You can put uh, an Excel, um, Excel file or a text file on your website and say, OK, you can use it. You can take that file and read it and do what you want. But the problem if you do that, and if anyone do that, there won't be any common format to link the data together and to uh, make use of it. For instance, if I put my, I don't know, list of friends in a text file on my website, and it's so, if someone else uses a different format for his text file, that will be two lists of friends, but there will be no way uh, to relate each other. So uh, the current effort around, uh, for instance, linking open data, is to put and to share your data on the web, but you use some common vocabularies and common uh, formats and means to put this data online so that everyone will put his data online using the same format, the same model, so that then when I want to find, uh, for instance, the list of uh, songs that my friend are listening to, I will use the same query of um, any of my friend's website because they will use the same format and the same languages. Um. Also because we, we have all these websites and they're all kind of disconnected from each other, it's useful to have some kind of common um, representation or some, some kind of common format that you can actually access information from multiple sites from um, in one go. Well, the, one of the biggest problems is, is that people who talk about the same things um, use different words, different identifiers to talk about the same things. Um, and so what we are faced with is um, a big data integration problem in the end, but it's a data integration problem at a large, a much larger scale than anything we've seen before in a way. And this will get even more um, complicated when we see like sensor data, etc., being available on the internet. So when there is these future applications which everybody's talking about now that you can talk with your appliances um, because they all are connected to the internet, etc., um, then this this problem will just um, amazingly increase. Now there is a big chance because this is kind of um, we are at the edge of this. Um, kind of technology jump where really um, internet technologies jump over also to like home use and not only are restricted to your computer or maybe now your telephone. Um, but there is still um, more chance of, of, of having things standardized so that uh, the big players um, get to agree on certain standards and not everybody uses a different format. Um, how, because, so standardization is anyway um, also one of the biggest parts of our work. At, at, at the beginning the web grew organically. People agreed 
to use the, the web standards by just downloading and installing the software, let it be a browser or let it be a web, a web the browser or let it be a web server. Um, but over time, it had to 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 convert into something more structured, and the growth and the change had to be managed. And that's why standardization organizations like W3C were founded and took care of those standards. Well, the the current um, current standards evolve in kind of two ways. Um, there are uh, on the one hand, there is um, standardization pushed by by industry and big um, standardization bodies like the World Wide Web Consortium or Oasis, um, and this strand makes most sense for um, standards which might be industry relevant. So I was talking before um, about this standards for appliances to be connected to the net or sensors, um, which is where the industry players first have to ideally agree on, um, so where there's still a chance that industry players agree to certain terms um, and then everybody uh, who's playing to the rules can talk to each other. Um, but there are on the web another strand of standardization is becoming equally important and this is kind of um, standards which evolve from small grassroots efforts which are just picked up by everybody and word of mouth and kind of viral, um, which become quasi standards just by being picked up. So that's happening a lot on the web. But both of these are equally relevant and important. So um, the, the, the basic um, take home message for this would be that whenever you do something on the web, whenever you want to have impact with your technology and your research on the web, look what is currently used, what is proposed by standardization parties, um, or what, is, what just the majority is using, and then try to adopt this and tie in with that. But we are also creating de facto standards. You can reach global agreement in many different ways. One is through official standardization groups, and as I said, that's one valid channel. But there's more around it. There's also de facto standard. When the web originated, it was not officially agreed upon. It was just adapted. People, people used it. They downloaded software and basically agreed to use these particular standards by actually, in fact, their, act, their actions. So it became a de facto standard and later went into standardization. Well, there is. Um these past few years, there have been a lot of effort around the linking open data projects. Uh, so now we got companies like the New York Times, the BBC that share their content on the web using this uh, linked data principles. There is also lots of uh, data from the HTLS domain. Uh, there are efforts like DBpedia, which is the Wikipedia translated in RDF. So there is more and more data sets published on the web. And what's important as well is that these data sets are linked together. So, for instance, when someone puts some data on the web, he can link uh, his data to DBpedia so that then you can browse um, the web and the semantic web from his website and his data set to DBpedia. And from DBpedia, you can find new information and then go, for instance, to the New York Times or to Freebase. What, what we are aiming at is to interconnect every bit of the information with other, with other information out there. And so that becomes traceable, becomes much more transparent how different pieces of information are related to each, to each other. It also increases the reusability. An idea no longer stands as an isolated idea. An argument no longer, no longer stands as an isolated argument. You have arguments pointing to each other, contradicting each, each other. Understanding an idea and all its implications becomes far more transparent and far more immediately understandable than before. Scientific discovery is something that, that does not happen then in the lab in, in much more, but happens when all the information is put together on, on the web. When you see arguments and counter arguments, when you see a new idea emerging and see how existing arguments are supporting or, or disupporting it in almost automatic fashion. And this is something that is right now being enabled for, for this. So right now, if you want to understand an idea, we have to re read a document, we have to read a book. And we, we don't have, typically don't have to read one book, but tens, hundreds of, of different articles to get all the different arguments that, uh, in, in, in for a certain uh, uh, hypothesis or against a certain hypothesis. Um, that, is, that then becomes a thing of the past because things are, the, Become, come together. I have, I have a claim, I have a thesis, I have a hypothesis, and I know all possible arguments in favor or against it 
automatically because they are just present. They're just there somewhere on the web linking to this particular idea. And that is a completely new, new aspect. The knowledge generation aspect is, is completely new. Knowledge is becoming much more, less effort to actually use, to produce, but also, but also to contribute from, to contribute to. I think you could get smarter access to information, more uh, context oriented as well. Um, so, for instance, geolocation can be uh, related to this information. Well, if you put more sense uh, in the web page that you describe and in the, the pages and the content that is indexed by these engines, uh, search engines, uh, they can guess from who you are and where you are that the information won't be delivered the same way. Right. Um, that's one possible use case. And where we can, yeah, I think that while well, search is probably the for the end user, one of the most uh, relevant thing, but I mentioned uh, biomedical information that is yeah. public on the web. That's also something that can have a great impact, not directly uh, when you browse the web, but for uh, biomedicine research, for instance, because uh, one project is called Linking Open Drug Data, and they translated different uh, drug banks and uh, other biomedical information and put them all together. So from the biomedical research point of view, that means that uh, information about a particular drug and the disease and uh, um, all this kind of information that was there but not linked together is now more easily accessible. So, so consider the word knowledge being, being really available at, at your fingertips and not just an arbitrary knowledge but everything and everything about a, a given aspect. And you know, and, and consider scientists debating climate change. Yeah, so right now you have different, different arguments being presented. Uh, you have believers, you have uh, disputers, you have... Um, it takes a huge amount of effort to understand each other's argument and to reconsolidate and go and, and clarify what it, what, it, what it takes right now. Basically these kind of disputes then become almost... become much more transparent because you can see all arguments, how they're linked to each other. You can see, you can try to, to find the flaw in, in, in one of the reasoning that each one of these groups is put, putting forward. Quite direct, a lot faster than, than, than right now, because right now everything is encoded somewhere in either data sets or in, in, in a document which somebody needs to, uh, needs to read. You have to, you have to go to other, other documents or to, to, to get a complete picture about what is really happening. You have to consult what God knows how many different information sources, that becomes a way of the past because all, everything is being pulled together. So the next stage um, is what I was um, mentioning maybe in the very beginning, um, getting closer towards um, real-time results, getting closer towards um, integrating um, information which is more current, like um, I mentioned for example this current location um, aspect or um, or sensor data if you want. So if you search for weather conditions in in your hometown, you don't want to get the results of what was indexed by a search engine three days ago, but you want to directly uh, query the source of that information. Um, and getting this, um, this data aggregated in a timely fashion with still providing reasonable response times to user queries, um, I think that's the next step to concentrate on. I, when we started about 10 years ago, um, it wasn't clear ex exactly how things would be going. It was m more five people in one room at, at, uh, at MIT at, at one point of time um, into something that is now really a worldwide effort where people are, are contributing. Um, if, so things have, de have developed quite dramatically and with everything that um, has Zipfian characteristics. There's typically a phase of exponential growth uh, which is following um, a very long, very slow growth. And I think we just entered the exponential growth, growth phase. So actually the first, uh, we could say that the first 10 years of the semantic web were about building the foundations. Uh, RDF, RDFS, our all the languages to create this data. But there were no much, uh, apart from academics, no much big public efforts and on the web to create data, I mean to put data available. Right. So I think we are no more at the experiment side. We are, we might not be completely at the mainstream level, but there's, I think that's the 
currently the transition between the early adopters and the mainstream markets. There are as well uh, more and more discussions on business models around this public data. The web is allowing us to stand on the shoulders of giants. We have this huge source of information that we can make use of, derive benefit from, um, make decisions based on. Um, we may not be necessarily standing on the, the shoulders of the right giants, I suppose. We not, may not be getting the right information um, because it's not presented to us in a way that's meaningful or uh, attractive to us. So the semantic web allows us to actually know that the information that we're getting is the, the stuff that is relevant to us. It's on a certain topic and allows us to basically stand on the shoulders of, of the right giants. Um, allows us, it allows us to make better decisions to create richer content um, based on basically a, a, an improved set of information that we're getting in the first place. The, the, the moment people start to use the thing, uh, like a, a new mashup or whatever, uh, you experience that there are like hundred things you haven't thought before of because you, know, you just designed the data or put the data out there and someone else has a totally different idea and there is that serendipity in it where you, you can't predict what is happening and that is the, the also the challenge, challenging part with it but it's, it's mainly uh, exciting just to see what happens if, if people use the data, the tools, what you provided out there and to create something totally new and that new thing again uh, forces us to think about new problems and, and new solutions actually. The web basically over a much, in a much lower way influence every possible aspect of society. I think it's fair to say that because it's hardly, we can barely remember how it was when we couldn't look up the, the um, when the tree train left the train station, where it took a phone call, sometimes to an automatic system or sometimes to a real life person to figure out even the most trivial in, 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 in information. It's very hard to go back to these days uh, again. So we sometimes we don't even realize how much the web actually has changed our the way how we deal with information and how we deal with, with go on with, with our daily daily lives. At the same time. The technology that's been developed here or that is right now emerging on the web is connecting every aspect of society much closer together. Nowadays you, you would not really think or can't really think what you would do without the web because we're so used to it, Twitter here and that and that, online banking whatnot what not else. But we managed to live without the web some 20 years ago, right? Uh, so, there, you know, it's not a totally break of everything we know and totally, you know, a new thing, but it definitely helped and, and changed and shaped the, the way we communicate, the way we share, uh, innovate, create new things and so on. And again, that linked data and semantic web will get us one step further, probably an easier way of communicating, sharing, innovating things, but not uh, fundamentally, yes, but not. A, I don't expect it to be like that boom, uh, uh, it's emerging uh, and, and, and we will just, you know, 10 years from, from now and we will just look back and think how could we ever have lived without uh, linked data and out without the semantic web.